it's the weekend and it's raining again. Uh, luckily that means all the water tanks are full, which uh, explains Humpty's enormous erection there. Uh, I've been out in the shed and I've been playing around with the oil system because I finally got some of the parts I was waiting for. Um, they didn't send me all of them. Um, I ordered eight of the little solder nipple things, but they didn't send me all eight, even though they billed me all eight. Um, they'd definitely forgotten about the order because I emailed them after about two weeks. And amazingly, it was shipped the very next day. So I wouldn't recommend that place. Um, but I was able to finally finish the oil piping on the bottom of the engine. And I've also made the Y pipe at the top of the engine that goes to the rocker gear. And because that was all in place, I figured I'm actually going to test and see if it works. So initially what I did was had the engine upside down and I took the oil filter off. Um, I've actually fitted a brand new oil filter to it now. But I had it upside down and I just tipped oil down the oil inlet pipe and turned the flywheel over by hand. And I did that enough to get oil pumping through the pump and coming up at the filter. Uh, then I flipped it back over. I pre-filled the filter and um, I did try by hand turning it over on the, on the flywheel. And that was working. You can turn it over easily enough. And I did start seeing some oil um, appearing at the, at the bottom of the engine. But it took quite a long time. I think even though I'd pre-filled the filter, it takes a while for the oil to get around everywhere. So I went ahead and mounted the starter motor. Uh, you can see sort of how that mounts on there. Uh, some of the latest starter motors, there's actually a hairspring that goes in here. A very light spring that is to help um, return this, flick it back, I guess. I don't think all the starters came with it, so I'm not sure I can actually fit it to this one or not. Um, or if you actually need it. Um, once the engine fires, it should sort of fling this back, and I'm assuming it's, it's, it flings it back so that it's, it's not going to interfere, it's not going to come back and hit the flywheel and rattle. But... Um, at the moment it's working fine and I'm just using my ancient battery which I rescued from the junk pile uh, to turn it over. It doesn't really have that much power uh, but it is enough to spin the engine and I made sure oil was everywhere that it should be already um, just with the oil can I just pre-oiled everything there's oil everywhere and turned it over on the starter motor and after a little while, oil started going everywhere oil should be going, um, including on the floor, because obviously I don't have the sump in place. Um, all I did was set up the little suction pipe there with a little tin can. I just kept filling that up with oil um, as it kept sucking it through. Uh, so oil is definitely getting to the big end bearings because I still don't have the, the last piston in place and oil is actually being flung out of the, the big end on, on number four because there's no, no connecting rod there, so it's just spraying it everywhere. Um, oil is pouring out the bottom of the engine as it comes out of the bearings. Oil is getting onto the intermediate shaft, so all behind here and down in here has got oil, and oil has been getting up to the Y pipe. Um, you can see it's just dripping everywhere. I did have to cobble together a little fitting for the oil takeoff. So at, at the takeoff down on the block there almost looks like a quarter inch pipe, um, which seems way too big and it's definitely way too big for modern style oil, oil gauges. So I made a little kind of reducer to reduce it down to one eighth line, which is more standard. And I do have an oil pressure gauge on there, but it barely registers maybe a few psi of pressure but like i say i can't actually spin it over that fast with this old battery um, but that's good it uh, it shows it's working one thing is the oil pump's actually reasonably slow because it's being driven off the intermediate gear so 
it's only been driven at half crank speed um, which is interesting uh, but apparently that'll give more than enough oil um, yeah, the other thing maybe worth mentioning is the oil I'm actually using is this Penrite Classic Light. This is for older cars. Um, so you can see where SAE 30 is meant to be used. And this has extra zinc in it, which is good for these older engines. So I think that should work fine. Um, I think the most important thing is to get the right grade of oil an oil appropriate for a vintage car and then just change it pretty regularly. I mean a car like this, realistically I'm not going to be doing high mileage in it. Um, so uh, I, like my MGB I just change the oil in the oil filter every year regardless of the mileage. Um, it's cheap enough that it's worth doing that. Uh, the only other thing to mention is I did have a slight accident which was I had the head sitting up on top of here. There's no studs or anything yet. Uh, it was just sitting there floating. I had a, the old gasket there as well. And that was so that I could work out the length of the pipes I needed here. So this will bolt up nicely to the front of the head. Uh, and then I went to spin the engine over and completely forgot there were no studs holding that head in place. So that kind of had a little bit of an accident and um, fell on the floor. So there's a bit of a chip out of the floor now. Uh, luckily the head... I, I sort of caught it a bit on the way down, so luckily it wasn't damaged at all. Um, but yeah, it just reminds me to, to be very careful. Um, but yeah, that's working well. Oil's definitely getting to everywhere it needs to get to. I won't know what pressure I'm getting until I can spin it over with a, a decent car battery and get some proper speed out of it, I guess. Um, but that's really good. Uh, I did notice that when I was turning it by hand on the flywheel, it did get easier to turn once oil actually started really flowing around the engine, um, which is also good to know. So I think now I have to clean up the massive oil spill I've got underneath it. And I completely forgot to mention what I was doing this morning. Um, I finally got around to measuring the actual compression ratio in the engine. Unfortunately, my burette um, had been broken. Uh, it was sitting up on a shelf. There was nothing around it, nothing on it, but somehow it managed to snap cleanly in half. So instead of a 100 milliliter burette, I ended up with a 50, something like that. But there was still enough of it there that I was actually able to measure things. So it's a little bit fiddly on this with the, the hemispherical um, pistons. What I actually did was I um, pushed the pistons down the bore until they were flush with the top of the bore. And I was able to measure how far down they went and figured out what that, um, the volume of that cylinder was just through simple calculations. And then I was able to use the burette and a um, clear acrylic plate with holes in it the same as you do when you're, you're CCing a head on top, of, on top of here. And I was able to figure out the volume um, off that space, which gives me the, the volume of the cylinder minus the volume of the dome. Once I knew the volume of the dome, I was able to um, measure the volume of the head, measure the volume of the um, gasket, and because I know, know the bore and the stroke, I can calculate the rest. So I ended up figuring out the compression ratio and it ended up being about 8.76 to 1. Um, I believe original Riley 9 engines were only about 5 to 1 normally. Um, I have seen figures that indicated Riley Brooklyn's were about 6.5 to 1. So 8.76 to 1 is, is reasonably high. Um, that should be fine, I think, with these engines. You, you can push them up quite high. And obviously the fuels and things we've got these days are much better. So it's uh, good to know. So the next thing is wait for the, the new piston rings gap, those. Don't forget that. And um, once I get the, the final piston in place, I can put in all the head studs and 
should actually be able to bolt the head on um, and probably then invest in a car battery which aren't cheap these days the uh, the prices of them has got pretty ridiculous I was thinking of getting a nice Optima battery which is what I've, what I've got in my MGB and it, they, they work really well and I'm sure the MGB one a year or two ago was 300 and something dollars and they now seem to be over 500 so um, I'll still I'll see what I'm going to do there for, for a battery but um, that's good definitely making progress again today there's a bit of a storm going on outside it sort of comes and goes by the looks of it it's not too bad here but it does get a bit windy um, I'm out in the shed again of course and now that I know the oil system is working and it's definitely working because there's oil everywhere um, I started playing around with the camshafts and the cam timing uh, I've previously done some films about measuring my camshafts uh, this was actually the the degree wheel I made to be able to do that on the lathe uh, for doing it in the engine I've just turned that around and sort of push that in and I've scribed a mark on here which is the um, top dead center position um, obviously you need something to reference that too and there isn't really anything on a Riley 9 engine so I've made up this temporary pointer with a piece of wire the um, the way this normally works apparently is when you set all of this up, there are meant to be marks on these wheels that you just align the dots and that sort of puts everything to where it needs to be. And mine are the, the, uh, the gear on the crankshaft definitely has two little marks, two little zeros stamped on those two teeth. I've sort of marked them with a sharpie so it makes it easier for me to find them. And the intermediate gear does actually have a, a little mark here it's a little bit worn out somebody's put a punch mark next to it but this tooth here is actually marked with a little zero so the first thing I had to do was align this with this which I've done and then supposedly there's meant to be marks on the the cam gears and this one does have a little E marking on it and this one seems to have maybe a mark there and there's another mark here which says M or W uh, I'm not sure depends which way up you look at it I guess and this one does seem to match up this one doesn't at all so what I've done instead is figured it out from the standard Riley 9 timings and the the figures they give you it's, it's taken me uh, a little while to get this sort of sorted out in my head and as a guide I'm going by the Newman cam um, information sheet off the uh, their spec sheet off the internet and that gives you things like the the duration and the lift and, and the timing and that sort of thing um, so my notes are all a big scribble here it's uh, it's quite easy to make mistakes with this stuff but what I've done is I've looked at the the standard Riley 9 timing and I looked at the graph I previously did off my camshafts the timing on those is more or less the same it's just the grind that's a little bit different I think and a little bit more lift um, obviously I have no idea what they've been ground to or what they're meant to match but the actual peak lifts and things like that aren't that different from from a standard one so I've gone with the same standard timing and the way they usually describe this is the inlet valve opens at top dead center and then closes 50 degrees after bottom dead center and the exhaust valve opens 55 degrees before bottom dead center and then closes 30 degrees uh, after top dead center and when I graphed my camshafts after I figured out the the shape of the lift on them I put them on this this graph which is against uh, it's basically lift in thousandths against crankshaft angle um, this all gets confusing as well because the camshafts are obviously going um, a different speed to the, the crankshaft but the timing is all done off the crankshaft so you have to make sure you get everything in sync correctly but you can see on the graph it's this this top line is the inlet and then over here is the exhaust um, 
if you take zero as being uh, top dead center on the inlet stroke, you can see the inlet valve is actually open just a little bit at zero. Um, and then its peak opening is at 110 degrees past top dead center on the inlet stroke. Then it closes, of course. You've got the, the big gap in the middle, which is the compression. And then the exhaust um, kind of opens up here. And its peak is uh, sort of after, if this is bottom dead center and it's now coming up on the exhaust stroke, its peak is sort of around here, about halfway along the stroke. Uh, one thing to note on my cams, the exhaust seems to, to have a very sort of shallow ramp on the opening. And I found it easier to do everything based on when the peak opening is not when they say the valve opens because the, the point at which you consider the valve opens depends on the manufacturer you because it's a gentle a gentle ramp up you have to pick an amount of lift which is what you're calling open or, or the start of the opening um, but if you don't know what that is you don't know where to start measuring from so it makes it a bit tricky so i've gone sort of backwards almost and gone well if this is the peak then go back from there and basically that's what I've done. I've set it up to match the standard cam timings. And those are now set up pretty well. Um, from what I can see on my cams, the, uh, the amount of lift that is considered the opening point is about 15 thou. And I think that kind of matches the, um, the Newman cams timing as well. So... This becomes important when you start looking at the valve clearances, the tappet clearances, because how you set that clearance has a there's sort of a relationship to how the slope on the, the opening and closing works with these ramps. Um, so the standard setting is, I think, uh, two, two or three thou hot. I think it's two on the inlet and three on the exhaust. Um, I know that the Newman cams recommend way more than that. Uh, I think it's about 10 to 15 thou is what they use for their settings. So that's something I'm going to have to play with. But definitely with the exhaust cam I've got, with its really long, slow ramp for the opening, um, I think I'm going to want bigger valve clearances there. Because if you set them to the standard 3 thou, it's going to be opening way before um, the... Um, the bottom of the uh, the stroke, so you can sort of see if this is top dead center, your your firing is happening up here somewhere, and you can see my exhaust cam seems to open really, really a very small amount, but very early. So I think what I'm going to want to do is have the the bigger clearance there, so the valve itself doesn't actually start opening till till much later. Um, this. Um, value that they give you here, this 55 degrees before bottom dead center, which is kind of in here somewhere. So um, what I can do is the way I've got it set up at the moment with the dial indicator, I can see what the, the lift on the cam is at that 55 degrees. And you could use that to figure out what the clearances are, I think. But of course, you have to take into account the, the um, rocker ratio as well. This I find all of this very confusing. Um, so, like everything I do when I'm not really certain what I'm doing, I just work through it very methodically. And I do little checks. So, one of the, the things is measuring the exact peaks of the lifts and things like that doesn't matter that much because if you think about it, you've only got so many positions this can go in. So, these are 26 tooth gears. And... That means um, if you rotate these round a tooth or two, you're, you're getting 28 degrees difference in the opening and closing positions or the peak position uh, because 360 divided by 26 gives you that 28. Um, it's, no, it's, it gives you 14 point something, but here is where the, the, the two to one ratio comes into effect. So the, the crank angle is actually twice that. Um, or is it half? Uh, like, like I say, this is all very confusing. 
but I just work through it really, really mechanically and methodically. And when I think I've got it right, typically what I then do is I make it wrong, uh, say by adjusting it one tooth and making sure it's wrong by the amount I would expect, if that makes sense. Um, it, it, we kind of have the same sort of thinking when we're doing software testing. Uh, you know, checking, it's almost like checking boundary conditions. You know when it's right, it should do this. If you make it wrong, it should do that. And if, if it's behaving how you think it's behaving, you should know what's going to happen. So that's what I do. Um, the first time I actually set it up, I managed to have the exhaust camshaft uh, effectively a cycle out. So um, they, weren't, they weren't matching. And uh, doing this, I'm pretty sure I've got them where they need to go now. And you can see this is effectively at top dead center. I'm not sure I'll actually be able to rotate this. Uh, it does seem to be getting easier to rotate. So if I, uh, except you get a lot of stiction on it. So I can rotate this by hand, but as soon as it's been sitting for a few minutes, it gets very sticky to start it rotating again. Once it rotates, it's fine. So there is a lot of stiction there. And it's a bit hard to do this with one hand. There we go. So this is on the exhaust at the moment. And I don't have a second gauge, so I've got a toothpick with some magnets. That's going to focus. Um, sitting on the exhaust. And to set this up, I've only got one tappet in place. Um, so I'm going to have to mark everything carefully, then take it apart, then put the tappets back in, and then put it back together. Um, because you, obviously you can't get the tappets in with the camshaft in place. So the um, if we can go backwards, so if we look at the ah, uh, no, it's going to be too hard to do with one hand. But um, trust me, I've been playing with this all afternoon, and I'm pretty sure it's right now. And you can actually start seeing things like the, how the valve overlap works, um, where the exhaust valve is closing, still closing while the inlet valve is still opening. There's not a lot of overlap on these engines, but um, it's kind of neat that you can, you can see what both of these are doing and see the relationship. Obviously, it's going to be much easier to see all of that when I've got the actual valve, uh, the rocker gear in place and the valves on, in place, but I can't do that until I've got the, the last piston in place. So, um, this setup works reasonably well. The point is reasonably accurate. Uh, you can, again, finding the, the peak lift, um, because the, the profile of the cam means it's kind of, there's a little bit flat on the top, so the needle will go up and then sort of hover for a bit and then come back down. Um, you don't have to be too accurate about that because you can only work to that 28 degrees accuracy anyway per tooth on this. Um, I don't think I'm explaining this very well. When you actually try and do it yourself and you, you're playing with this and rotating it and looking at the angles and looking at the lift, it does actually make sense. But... I'm going to mark these up so I know exactly where they go back together and I'll put in the rest of the tappets and then just have another check and make sure that's all correct. So people do play with the cam timing obviously to, to get more power out of them. Um, I think the original timing is fairly conservative of course. My cams are pretty close to standard cams though supposedly they're a bit better. I think really the only difference is there's a bit more lift. Um, so for now, I am going to go with the standard timings because, like I say, that having that one tooth adjustment is so coarse, I, I'll be too far out if I, if I get it wrong. Um, you can buy adjustable cam gears for these that let you dial it in, and the other way you can handle it is to make offset wood rough keys. So you can put the, the gear on the shaft in a slightly different relationship, but as I keep saying, my aim is just to get an engine that runs to start with. And I know with all the standard settings, it should run fine. Um, and then I can start, if I want to, 
or if I want to invest the time and the money in it, start adjusting it from there. Like I say, I'm not racing it, so is it worth doing? That's what I wonder. Um, whereas, for, and the, the thing that worries me is if, if I start trying to tune it now without having a base point, I, I, you don't know if what you're doing is going to be any better or not. Um, so I would rather start from a known place and then make adjustments and see what happens. Um, that's my thinking at the moment. Anyway, uh, we'll see. Okay, I've realised I've been an idiot. Um, I used to have a friend who would say to me I was 95% genius, 5% idiot. And I think this is one of those 5%. Um, I finally figured out how this works. I could never quite understand in the in the manuals where they talked about setting this up and then lining up the marks on the cam gear. Uh, I never knew what they were actually referring to. And obviously there's a two to one relationship between the crank gear and the cam gears because um, these are running at half the speed. But it never occurred to me what the gearing was on the intermediate gear. Uh, and it doesn't matter, as long as it meshes with, with the, the crank gear and the cam gears, it doesn't matter how many teeth there are on that. That depends on uh, the gear teeth pro profiles and, and things like that. So I've been marking things off the intermediate wheel, which makes no sense, because this is a 13 tooth gear. The cams are 26, and this one is... 35, 36, I think. I can't remember. I did count it a minute ago and I've forgotten. But it's not a multiple. So this isn't running in sync with either the cam or the crank gears. So measuring off this makes no sense. Um, it worked fine for what I was doing because I was just using it to give me a, a relative position while I was making the adjustments. So I could tell if I'd move one or two teeth. Um, but I finally figured out what they mean about lining up these marks. And effectively what you do is you, you set the crank to um, top dead centre. So the two little marks are at the top there. Uh, you can see the piston is at top dead centre. And now if you look on the cam gears, you can see the little E for exhaust. And this little mark, which I think is an I that's more or less worn out for the inlet. And basically you make that the gear, that's oh, the tooth that's in mesh. So you can see the E is the one in mesh here, and the same with the I here. Uh, so that's how that works. So, yeah, sometimes these things aren't obvious until you've, you've, you've figured them out the long way around. But I have the um, exhaust tappets in. I need to take this out because I need to get a, a nut on the, 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 the flange on the bush, which is actually in under there, so it's a bit awkward to get to. Um, I think I'll do that one first and then um, take the cam out and um, then I can get to the, the cam bush through here, I guess. Um, so, or I can take the intermediate gear out. Um, I should mention it's, it's actually, you have to be quite careful when you're, when you're meshing these gears and trying to get them set up right because they're um, cut on this helix angle it means they don't just drop straight on. You, you have to rotate them and they drop and they rotate as they go down. So you have to get your, your teeth positioning correct. And the other problem I'm finding on this one is you can't pull the intermediate gear off, which is um, probably the easiest way for me to do up those nuts is to pull this off. But you have to have the crank in a certain position because of the crank nut. You can see this as it comes up hits the, the nut unless it's aligned with one of these flats. So that's why I'm going to rotate this slightly and mark the teeth and not turn anything. And then I can get it all back in the same position. Um, I've just gone ahead now and measured it again with the dial indicator to confirm that the cam is in the right position. Um, I know that is, so I'll lock that in place. Uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning is, I know I bang on about it, but this stand is just so, so good for working on this engine, being able to rotate it so I can actually do things like this. And the other thing that's really useful is a magnetic pickup so that you can actually fit the tappets on it and slide them in. 
from the bottom of the engine. Uh, you can't see at the moment the camshaft's in the way, but um, the bottom ones aren't too bad. The, the top two get a little bit fiddly because you've got the um, engine mounting bar going right through the middle, right where the, the tappets need to go. So you need to kind of get in around that. Uh, the engine's all back together. I've checked the timing just on the number one cylinder. Um, a laser cut new gasket and I've actually fitted the timing cover. It's not bolted on yet and there's no um, sealer on the gasket because I may have to take this apart and redo it. And I thought I was done for the night and I tipped the engine up so that oil doesn't drip down onto the clutch and I realized there was a little problem. That's a tappet. Um, that should go there. That's the hole for the lag tappets and I'm not using them on this engine. So I have to take it apart again just to move that one tappet into its correct hole. Um, this is what I was saying before about it being kind of awkward with the engine mounting bar going right through there. It makes it difficult to see at times. But um, at least now I know how all the gears go back together. It won't take me too long to take this apart, um, pull the cam out, and um, swap that round. It is a little bit tricky though getting the um, the nut on the front of the, the bearing for the cam. Uh, you can get a spanner in there but you can only turn it sort of um, you know half a flat each time. You have to keep turning the spanner a little bit, turning it over and turning it a bit more. So I'm going to take this apart again and get that tap it in the right place and then put it back together. That didn't actually take too long. Um, now I know what I was doing. It only took 10-15 minutes to fix that. Uh, the biggest problem was I dropped one of the washers down into the block and being a, a dark coloured washer against the, the dark inside of the block it took me a while to find it. I did tip the engine up to hoping it would drop out but everything is so saturated in oil now um, it stuck to the side and it wouldn't just fall fall out. So a bit of digging around I found that finally put it all back together. Um, I've retested, rechecked it and it is correct. Um, it's worth noting on my engine at least, I don't know if all Riley 9s will be like this, but with the the marks on the gears lined up the way they say you should in the book, um, the number one piston is on the um, top dead center on the compression stroke so that's worth bearing in mind uh, so I think I'm going to clean up again and uh, cover this up just so it doesn't get covered in dust and I think that's probably it for today for this weekend um, I am still waiting for my new watch um, People tease me about having a, a calculator watch, but I actually use it all the time, uh, especially for doing things like this when I was trying to figure out the angles, um, you know, figuring out sort of 55 degrees before bottom dead center and, and having to subtract that from 180 and not make mistakes so that I could uh, tell what the different angles were on the degree wheel. Um, I use it all the time for things like that and doing a lot of metric to imperial conversions so I'm really missing not having it um, and I had to go and dig out this which was a another old solar powered credit card calculator which I'm not even sure where I, I got that from I think I might have found it um, just on the footpath in front of my house one day when I used to live up in Auckland but that works pretty well as well <laughs>